Davut ediyor. Çekin. Okay, we're good, eh? <clears throat> Demba, nice to see you, brother. So, good morning, everybody. Those are, that are here and those that are at home, wherever you are, welcome to you. Beautiful day we have. We're looking forward to a lovely time before the Lord together. Uh, technology helps us. Some of us are learning a lot about it as we go. So, welcome to all of you. And um, well, I think we've got Declan leading us today. Dick, come up and lead us in some worship. Uh, let's stand together, shall we? Father, we thank you. And words can't express our gratitude to you for all that you are to us, all that you mean. Thank you that you are the life, the giver of life. You're the one that carries us through dark nights. You're the one who walks with us in the storms. And Lord, you are the one who promises to never leave us, the ever-present help in time of trouble. So we thank you for that. And as we worship today, Lord, we pray that our hearts have been large. We pray that our understanding would be expanded and we find ourselves engaging with you uh, in, in depths and in heights that we haven't known. So we, we welcome your presence and we invite you, Lord, to come and be the Lord of this event. Those of us that are here and those that are at home or wherever they might be, come by your Spirit and lead us to worship in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
like to invite you now as we carry on with worship just to come and put some money towards others. We're taking up an offering for mercy needs amongst us. So just as we continue worshiping the baskets here on the front, uh, please give generously. And also to those watching, um, if you'd like to deposit into the church's bank account, please mark it as mercy. And that's what our offering will be going towards. So thank you. Let's continue worshiping together. Jesus, you truly are worthy of it all. So worthy. I was even just thinking how, how you felt we were worthy, that you would die for us, that we were worth dying for. Skabengas like us, lost, yeah. 
And yet, you gave it all. Thank you, Lord. You gave it all for us. Because you felt we were worth it. Help us just to express that back to you. Yes. To express our gratitude for what you've done. The enormity of that sacrifice. Yes. The amazing grace. That when we weren't looking for you, you came looking for us. Thank you, Lord. You came to seek and save those who were lost. You left the 99 and you came for the one. Thank you for your love. Just, just pray right now that we would know how deep and how wide yeah. and how high is this love of Christ. Just pray for every person watching, every person here. Yeah. That each day we would grow yeah. in knowing you, not knowledge, not just knowledge, but in knowing you for ourselves. Yes. Knowing you personally and intimately as a loving father. Thank you for that, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that we can be together today. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Thank you for those that are watching, that have joined us, and those that are here. Yeah. We've just got a couple of announcements we'd like to share just before Dave comes up and shares part two of the message and the prayer from Revelation. Alpha is starting on the 3rd of September. That's the first Thursday of September, and we'd like to invite you to join up. It's going to be completely online. So there'll be no physical meeting together, no physical meals together. So please sign up. It has been WhatsApp uh, on the church, uh, WhatsApp events group, and it's also on our Facebook page. So please sign up for that. Good news as well that House Church has started meeting last week, Wednesday. So if you haven't yet started to meet, please do so. Obviously, observing all protocols, I would suggest rather not eating together. I know we, that's what we decided, is we're not going to have a meal together. We normally do. So that might be a wise way just to start and keep your masks on and make sure you're safe. And also, I don't, it's such a beautiful day. Those of you watching, please come join us for a coffee afterwards. Come at half past 10 and uh, come to the car park. Bring your kids, bicycles, rollerblades. Come and have a coffee with us afterwards. We just want to slowly get people to start mingling again and, and getting out. And um, I want to show you some more plans. Last, last week, Gav showed us some plans for the East Wing. We've got some other ideas, and these aren't cast in stone, but we're inviting conversation around this. We've got a few ideas. So I just want to take you through some ideas that we see for our, for our, 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 our property over here. So let's have a look at that, Simone. Eh? We've got a... So uh, Ivan, thank you. Ivan very kindly has drawn this to scale for us. Um, so here's our, here's our building, and there's the east wing, which will go on top. What we have over there is currently retrade. We, we have an idea to turn that into a gazebo coffee station where moms and dads can come and sit and relax and have a cup of coffee and order it from our coffee shop. Over here is what we're calling a pump track which is a we'll show you some photographs shortly and that'll be a bit of an outdoor dirt track for mountain bikers um, over there this could move perhaps to over here um, but that there we're looking at an outside gym something like you may have seen on the beachfront or in some of the parks but something really smart that people can come and work out at there's retrade right there in the corner of our property over here is the veggie garden we're planning, around about 20 by 20. That'll be a training, a pilot project, but also training those that are interested in growing their own vegetables God's way. And over here we've got our existing soccer field, and over there we've got the two homes, the children's home and then also Sharon's house will be coming in there, which will be a home for moms that are pregnant that don't have anywhere to stay, uh, and even those that have possibly just given birth. But Richie and Kate will tell us a bit more about that. But if we can have a look at some more graphics, some ideas, um, there's just a bigger area so you can see. That'll be the gazebo. Over here is the existing play area. 
at the back where, where the Sunday school kids are playing already. And we'll upgrade that, uh, take away the fences so there's just a, a really nice free flow. Um, the pump track. All right, let's, let's look at the next one there, please. Okay, here's some, an outdoor gym. This fit, roughly fits into a diameter of about 15 by 15. And if anyone's got a spare 200,000 Rand lying around, I've already got a quote for this. And um, they'll come and install it for us. Um, it's weatherproof. It's even the strongest oaks on the earth are hopefully not going to break this. But um, we're really inviting, I really want to encourage people to come talk to me about these ideas and collaborate, see what we can do. And businesses that might want to um, get involved. I'm going to show you some more story, uh, ideas, but I want to share a quick story. Um, Steve Duplessis and I were on the little mound of sand outside and two boys had just rolled into the parking lot and I called them over. I said, boys, don't you want to come and help us design a little mountain bike track? And they said, yeah, when can we start? And, you know, um, and anyway, we just got chatting. I said, guys, you're young, but you guys know what you're looking for. Anyway, that evening I got a WhatsApp from one of my younger daughter's friend's moms. And she says, did you meet my son today at the church? So somehow this little guy had gone home, explained to his mom who he'd met and what his name was. And she put two and two together and took a flyer, sent me a WhatsApp. Anyway, it turns out it was me and it was him. And I have met this boy before, but he's grown so much and wearing a mask, you don't actually recognize them. Anyway, she said, do you guys have a youth? And I said, yes. And guess what? He came to youth that Friday. And he's been coming for about five weeks now. So we really see the impact this can make on our community around us. An outreach tool, it's breaking through the walls, spirit breakout. We want to break out from our four walls and we want to reach people. We want to love people. We want them to know we're normal. We're not weirdos. We're not tucked up here doing some weird ceremonies in a building. We're normal people. We love people. And so those are some of our ideas. There's our gym. There's the pump track. So what I love about this idea, if you guys want to go and Google a pump track, but from an adult right down to probably a four-year-old, we could all use this track. Um, the whole idea is that you're using the momentum of your bike and you're doing some, uh, some walls and what they call a berm to, to generate speed so that more uh, the, the older guys will go up a little higher and generate some speed um, and the younger guys obviously might not even make the wall they'll just take the corner gently but that's the idea uh, you can see it's in a, just a really small area you can put quite an exciting challenging track and then um, let's have a look this is some ideas for a, a thatched gazebo uh, outside the idea you know a mom can order some coffee and, and the kids can be playing. Dad can be working out on the gym. The child is playing some, riding a bike or playing in the, on the jungle gym. Um, and even parties. We're thinking of offering the facility for moms that want to come and have a party here and bring their own food or order from Charmaine. Let's have a look at the next one. Have we got any more slides? Okay, there's the East Wing, which we saw last week, but for those who haven't seen it, you can just keep going to no thanks. So that's another graphic. And this is the retrade project. That'll be going up in the corner. It's going to be really smart. Our facility, we just see something really, really looking good and uh, touching lives. And that's it. Thanks, everybody. Very good. So please come and chat with me. I've actually started having some conversations already <coughs> with people who've got ideas. So um, I'd love to hear your your thoughts and what you'd like to contribute. Uh, Hannah and I are actually chatting about inviting moms and dads to come one Saturday and the dads, we can start building a couple of ramps and doing just a few little things that the kids can start enjoying and the moms can just fellowship a bit. We'll open the coffee shop. So there's some ideas. So please support us. Even if you just come, we'd love to have you. But I'd like to ask Dave to come up. Dave's going to be sharing with us, won't you stretch out your hands and let's pray for him. Yeah, Lord, we thank you for this book of Revelation. And I uh, pray, Lord, that Dave will be able to just share it, Lord, with such simplicity. Often we so complicate 
the message behind it. So help Dave just to, to share it, Lord, in, in a simple, encouraging manner for each one of us. Mm -hmm. And thank you, Lord, that our hearts will be gripped with excitement for the future, Lord. Yeah. Not a fear of the unknown. We so often get fed so much nonsense through movies and books that Christians actually become fearful, Lord. So yeah. help us to be inspired today with faith, to trust you, and to be hopeful and excited about the future. Mm. In Jesus' name, Amen. I pray. Amen. 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 Thanks, Josh. Thanks, guys. It's good to be together, eh? Hey? Yep. It's always good. It's always good. Yep. And those at home, I'm glad you can tune in as well. Trust is going to be helpful. So, last week, um, I just want to say, it was lovely at House Church on Wednesday, Wednesday, having you there, Sean. It was great, man. And just the openness of your heart and what God's been doing in your life, we just picked it up straight away. So I was very, I came home and told Colleen, this is a very exciting evening. Because Sean is one of the sons of this church, and we went through some difficult times about how many, about 12 years ago. And a lot of the yet younger generation was affected by some of the stuff. And it's been absolutely a gift of grace that God is doing some restoration. Uh, we, we, we celebrate that day. And, uh, yeah. Hello. Okay. Just check. Is it on? Can you check on your phone? There you go. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. It's still situated. Sorry about that, guys. Not sure what happened. But we need to uh, make sure that we all stay connected. So, so John on the Isle of Patmos is having a long time with the Lord. And, uh, and in the process, God began to show him pictures. And, and what he did... Uh, he brought cameos of what it means to follow Jesus, story after story, picture after picture. And, and so there's a, a lot of revisitation of different scenarios. And uh, John was coming at this from different angles. I want to make it very clear from my side. And I, as I said last week, I really don't mind if you would differ from uh, my interpretation of Revelation, which is not just a private interpretation, by the way. There's thousands of us that believe it like this. We, we do not see... Uh, the church experiencing a rapture, a snatching away. And uh, as I mentioned last week, there's a, a view of that, some base it on any one of three scriptures, Matthew 24, there's a reference that implies this. 1 Thessalonians 4 implies some kind of taking away. And of course, um, Revelation chapter 4 verse 1 speaks of being taken up. But it's John being taken up in order to show, be shown things. It's not a escaping from the trouble. So the, the point is that why would God snatch the church away and then send all these encouraging pictures when the church is no longer there needing them? Sure. So uh, we, don't, we don't believe that the rapture is, in, is intended to be a snatch away. It's, it's what happens, as 1 John 3 says, when we see him, we shall be changed to be like him. It's a rapturous transformation that happens. Um, and there is so much in Scripture that encourages us to be strong during the time of trial. It says, when you go through the deep waters, I will be with you. So it's a book of encouragement. And just to say also, as a, by, by way of recapping, that uh, a good eschatology, a good study of end times thinking, and end times scripture, must land on encouragement. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, he says that, uh, wherefore, encourage one another with these words. And it's a whole chapter all about, about that. So I want to... Um, I want to build on that today, and we went up to chapter 8 last week, in which, uh, uh, in chapter 8, and it starts in chapter 5 already, he speaks about the effect of prayers, and, and how God loves the aroma of prayers, and he adds incense to it, and, and uh, prayer is like perfume before God, huh? um, and when we pray, we change the atmosphere, just, which is exactly what perfume does, huh? I mean, if you, if you walked in some dog poo and you come into the house, I'm sure somebody will point that out to you. Something's, something's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but when you've been praying and you come into the house, someone, people say, something's changed for the good. Yep. What's this thing? Because you come from a place of prayer. Prayer changes the atmosphere. So we're going to uh, dig into, from, from uh, chapter, end of chapter 8, going on into, uh, right up to, into, if we can, up to chapter 16. Just touching some of the cameos. And chapter 16 speaks of the Armageddon. So I'll land at Armageddon. We'll, we'll, we'll land there. Hopefully that'll be helpful to you. 
Uh, some of you who know your history will remember the 6th of June, not that you were there, but you might remember it, is from reading 1944, what, what was become known as D-Day, the day when 150,000 Allied forces, most American, uh, Canadian and British forces, landed on the, the French uh, port of Normandy, on the beaches of Normandy, and started a massive invasion to rout out the Nazis. And uh, what a day that was. Uh, 4,000 ships, 11,000 airplanes, warplanes, um, and, and estimates are anything up to 50% up to of them actually got killed. But they obtained what was clearly a victorious moment. From that time on, Jerry was on the run, as they say. The Nazis were, were, were in retreat as a result of D-Day. And then uh, on, uh, on the 8th of May, 1945, uh, Hitler gave up and uh, Germany surrendered. And that's what's called V-Day or V-E Day, uh, Victory in Europe Day. And uh, in a sense, this is what we're celebrating in our faith. Mm. We've had a D-Day. Jesus, according to Colossians 2, he triumphed over Satan and all his enemies at the cross. But yet we know that Satan is continuing doing, doing, making trouble for, for mankind. But D-Day has happened. And it's guaranteed that V-Day will come. Yeah. So we are living in the land between. We, uh, it's a very encouraging time to be alive because you, you, you're guaranteed the victory. Yeah. Okay. From, from 6th of June, 1944, it was a guarantee of victory. Uh, the Nazis were backpedaling, moving back. And, and, and what, a, what a conflict. The, the estimates are that 85 million people died in World War II. 85 million. Wow. Huh? That was, at that time, about 3% of the entire world population. Sure. So it was a massive moment. Um, as they established, we will not give up, as what did, Hitler say, uh, what did uh, Winston Churchill say in response to all Hitler's threats? Uh, never, 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 never give up. And so Revelation is a book helping us to never give up. And so... In the letters, those love letters that Jesus wrote to the churches, every one of them ends with, He who overcomes. He who overcomes. We are on, on this, this, the side that has, that has participated in, in D-Day. And we are marching forward to V-Day. So it's a wonderful uh, picture for us to think about. But when we think about prayer in the context of this, what, what we need to know is that prayer is two things. One is prayer is saying something to God. Being honest with him, telling him how you are, telling him what your needs are, and, and, and worshipping him. But it's us telling God. But secondly, good prayer is when God says things to us. Yeah. We start to hear him. He gives us pictures. He leads us to scriptures. He changes our, our, our attitude, our mind. And, and, uh, and we start to hear from God. Huh? And that's what he wants us to, to get hold of. Um, and in fact, when he speaks to us, um, faith rises in us because Faith comes by the hearing of the word of, of Christ. As he speaks, faith rises. So as a result of prayer, when we listen to God, and over the last little while, I've, I've had some lovely times with the Lord, um, and, and really find this quite exciting, uh, a rediscovery of, of listening prayer. Mm. That's huh? good, Dad. Listening prayer. And, uh, and, and the Lord adds to it, and, and I really look forward to my times in the mornings uh, with the Lord. So we, I can listen better to him. But if we go back, and if you've got your Bibles there, I want you to go with me um, in Revelation chapter 8. If you can open up Revelation chapter 8, just to pick up there, so we're overlapping with where we left off from last week. And we've got uh, seals, we've got trumpets, we've got bowls. He uses different imagery to, to emphasize different levels of, of, uh, of havoc and plague and persecution and different seasons of it. Um, these were going to be happening repetitively throughout the church age in which we are now living. And when we get right back to Revelation 20, I'll talk more about the millennium. But we understand the millennium to be the thousand years, and it's a figure of thousand years, but it's a time of reigning through Christ on the earth, which is what we are engaging with. We are living in this church age, in this millennium. So when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God and, 
and to them were given seven trumpets. Another angel who had a golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. The smoke of the incense, together with the prayers of the saints, went up before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, hurled it on the earth, and there came peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. And you just remember around the time that, Paul was, that John was writing this about, actually just a few years before John wrote this, Vesuvius erupted. So earthquakes was a very, very hot topic of conversation in his time. It erupted so severely that two cities completely disappeared. They were completely buried um, from the effect of the, of the earthquake. Verse 6, And the seven angels um, who had the seven trumpets prepared to sound them. Now, now a trumpet makes a sound. And you're going to see these trumpets coming up again and again over the next little while. And it's God saying, when stuff happens, learn to listen to what I would be saying. He sounds a trumpet. Um, in fact, in Exodus chapter 19, uh, when Moses was uh, uh, talking to the Israelites, and uh, um, you pick up in verse 16, um, he says, On the morning of the third day there was thunder and lightning with a, a thick cloud um, over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. And, and so Moses begins to open up this with a blast of a trumpet, uh, the awareness that God is wanting to speak. And the next chapter is when he unloads the, the Ten Commandments. And he brings it out to the people. Whenever God wants to get our, our attention, the word trumpets is used. And uh, some or other, we've had the trumpet of coronavirus. Eh? Mm. God getting our attention. Uh, it's hardly a person who could, who could honestly say, I know nothing about it by now. Yeah. It's, it, it's been a massive trumpet was in fact um and the, the when god gets our attention it's because he's about to do something major something seriously significant i mean you take joshua chapter six with the with the shouts and the trumpets remember the walls of jericho came down uh the trumpet the the, the declaration of god brings down the barriers so we saw that then and we we see it today in fact uh god used uses plagues and disasters to get our attention um, like he did with egypt and in this uh, in this uh, revelation passage we, we we have comparisons with egypt um, just like god was wanting to call his people out of bondage under pharaoh in in egypt so and he, and he got their attention um, with those plagues so for us also god is is drawing us out um, and in the time of of John's writing, the, uh, the real issue was, was Rome, and there was a comparison between uh, Egypt and Rome. And, and God wanted to set his people free from the oppressor, op the oppressor that kept them in bondage. Um, why? Because he wants to bring forth a new humanity. Mm. Uh, in Galatians 4.19, uh, Paul writes about how he's like a, in, in, the, in the labor of childbirth, of, of agonizing, uh, to bring forth Christ in, in, in the people that he was seeking to lead. And uh, that's, that's you and me. There's this, God is uh, wanting to bring forth the, the image and the nature of Jesus, this new humanity. In Romans 8, creation is longing. Romans 8, verse 20 to 22. Creation is yearning and groaning and longing until Christ be seen. Huh? There's this, there's this um, longing to, for liberation from the bondage to decay. To be brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. God is wanting us to live in the new way on earth, which incidentally is the reason, uh, the reason I don't, I, I sincerely seek to avoid using the social constructs of our race classifications. It's a social construct that was contrived by oppressors to take dominion over others. And now, sadly, uh, the, the, the previous victim now wants to become the oppressor. And when you have that, the vision is too small. We've got to get something more. Because two wrongs won't make a right. Yeah. Oppression by one over another, being reversed, and making the first one who was the victim now become the oppressor, and the other become the victim. This is not going to fix anything. The kingdom of God is a much bigger picture. Yeah. So when they ask you what race you are, just say human. Yeah. 
Amen. 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 Human. And I know there are others that think now when I say that I'm downplaying the, the need to uh, for restitution to make right. No, 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 not at all. But I am downplaying entitlement. I'm upplaying empowerment. Yes. <coughs> eh? yes. Come on. You don't help somebody necessarily if you spend, if you help them their whole life just to be entitled. Yes. Mm. But if you motivate and train and equip and call them out and empower them, that's a different deal. Yeah. Come on, church. Yeah. So, we've been having some fun at Dub Dub because Colleen says, you know, she's a midwife and a, a doula and helping with births and things. So, that's been quite fascinating. Uh, in fact, just last Sunday. It was last Sunday. I think it was. The, the weeks running to each other, I forget, there was a birth at, at our home and it was quite something. Uh, I was alone, uh, the only one not involved, obviously. <laughs> so, <laughs> I made a bride. I, I had a one man bride. Have a bride on your own. <laughs> I never bride my own. I did. I had a bride on my own. And that's all uh, all experience um, on, its, on its own. And um, I want to. Uh, Tell you a little bit about some of that because you know I find it very um, inspiring to think of the things that that, that uh, God can teach us from the natural to the spiritual. So many things that He He opens up for us that really helps us to to live in a different way um, and be expectant. So can I read this interesting article you have by a teacher? She writes about this experience in her classroom. Um, one day, this little girl, Erica, very bright, very outgoing child takes her turn in, in oral, you know, when it's time to do a mandolin, an oral, hey, present, uh, like a show and tell. She comes up to the front of the class and she's got a pillow stuffed in her, in her tummy here. She's, got a, so she's looking seriously pregnant. And uh, she comes up to the front and, um, and then she, she holds up a, a, a photograph and she says, this is a, a picture of Luke, my baby brother. I'm going to tell you about his birthday, she says. First, Mom and Dad made him as a symbol of their love. <clears throat> and then Dad passed a seed, put a seed in Mom's stomach and Luke grew in there. He ate for nine months through an umbrella cord. <laughs> She's standing there with her hands, as the teacher says, uh, on the pillow. And she, the teacher says, I'm trying not to laugh. Uh, and, and I'm wishing that I had my recorder here to catch it. Uh, and the kids are just watching in amazement. And so, and so little Erica goes on. Then about two Saturdays ago, my mom starts going, oh, 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 oh. Erica puts her hand behind her back and she starts groaning. She walks around the, and then she says, my, my mom walked around the house for like an hour saying, oh, oh, oh. And then the child is doing this in the classroom. <laughs> and uh, uh, then, then she said, and my dad called the middle wife. <laughs> And uh, she delivers babies, but she doesn't have a sign on the car like the Domino's man. She's not that kind of Mr. Delivery. Uh, they got my mom to lie down in, a, in, in bed like this, and then Erica lies down on the back against the wall. And then, pop, she says, my mom has this bag of water she kept in there in case she got thirsty, and it just blew up and spilled all over the place. Like, shh. <laughs> and... Uh, then the middle wife says, says, start, push, 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 breathe, breathe, breathe. And she goes through this whole process. And then they started counting, she said. And they had never got even past 10. Then all of a sudden, out comes my brother. He was covered in yucky stuff that they all said was from mom's play center, so there must be a lot of toys inside there. <laughs> and when he got out, the middle wife spanked him for crawling up there in the first place. <laughs> Uh, anyway, uh, we laugh. We laugh a little in life, don't we? Ah, oh, yeah. So, going back to, to Revelation chapter chapter eight, I want to pick up on a few things here and open it up a bit more for us here. Um, watch, going right down to, to verse thirteen, he says, "As I watched, I heard an eagle." And you'll see again and again in this book, I heard, I heard, going to chapter 9, um, verse 13, I heard a voice coming from the, from the horns. Um, I heard, chapter 10, um, verse 4, I heard a voice from heaven. And uh, verse 8 of chapter 10, then I, the voice that I had heard from heaven spoke to me once more. 
He said to me, verse 9, and go right through, you can just flip through how many times he says, I heard, I heard, he spoke, I heard. Can you understand? John is having this, this quiet time, this prayer time, and he's listening. He's listening. I think our, our coronavirus lockdown season with all the strange new dynamics has been a time for us to be invited into a listening place. Eh? It's been a time for reset, a time to listen. <clears throat> and so we have the trumpets. It's God saying, will you listen? When the trumpet blasts, will you please listen? I want, you, you need to awaken to something here. Be alert to what's going on. Um, and, and then if you flip on to, to chapters 10 and 11, he has the discussion in, Re in Revelation about the two witnesses. Um, there's a little scroll, an angel and a little scroll in chapter 10, going on to the two witnesses in chapter 11. And there's, there's been lots of debate about who those are. Is it good? It's bad. Um, but I believe those two witnesses are symbols of, because you know, Scripture speaks of two or three establishing the integrity of a statement. Where two or three agree, for instance, God gives it. And a matter should be established in the, in the witness of two or three. So uh, it's the witness of the church. This is the, um, what John is saying. The end, the, the, the last of the last days, before the end, in other words, the church will share her message. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess, because there will be a massive outpouring of the Spirit of God and awakening. Uh, and the witness of the church will rise up in confirmation, two witnesses. Jesus sent his disciples out as a prefiguring of this. You remember in Luke chapter 10, he sent them out, the 70, in twos? Always twos, two witnesses. And um, so, so this, uh, these witnesses are a reference to the testimony of the church, the message of the church. Um, and uh, in Acts chapter, chapter 1, verse 8, he says, you will receive power when the Spirit of God comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. Not you'll try to be, uh, you may be, you might have an opportunity to be. You will be. When the power of God comes on you, your life be so different. You'll be alive, uh, as John Wesley called himself, a, a brand plucked from the burning. Yeah. There's a fire that burns in you for love for God and the greater purposes of, of His kingdom and the new humanity. And so you become part of the answer. Mm, um, that's good. And, and you will be my witnesses. Right. You will be. If the Spirit of God is upon you, you will be a witness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It won't be an optional thing that you can no. consider doing. You will be my witnesses. Yeah. And if you're not being a witness, well, ask God to give you more of the Spirit. No. And that's what I want to say. We do believe in, in repeated infillings of the Spirit. Uh, we, uh, when Moody was a great British evangelist, was asked why he preached about repeated infillings. He says, of course, I leak. Mm. We need to be reminded and drawn back to God. Eh? Come on, if you, if you love someone, you don't just tell them once you love them. You tell them probably every day and a few times in the day for about 50 or 60 years. Mm. You know what I'm saying? It's a, it's a renewing, it's a renewing. And so Ephesians 5 says, be being filled with the Spirit. It's an ongoing, present, continuous. Eh? Be being filled with the Spirit. So the two witnesses is an encouragement for the church to uh, rise up and be what the Spirit empowers us to be. Um, and it, it speaks of the three and a half years, if you read, that comes up a few times. And three and a half years is a time of trial. There are two, two numbers that speak of trial. Three and a half years. And remember Jesus' life on earth, his public ministry was approximately three and a half years as well. Forty is the other one, which speaks of a, a season of testing, a trial that shapes you. And it was true of Moses, it was true of Israel, 40 years. Eh? Uh, Jesus, 40 days between um, his resur resurrection and his ascension, 40 days. There's a season uh, where things are beginning to change into a new chapter. Mm -hmm. and, but three and a half years is a time, uh, as Daniel calls it, time, times, and half a time. You know, there's three and a half years. A time is a year, so times, and there's three and a half years of time. Trouble of difficulty. Elijah, similarly, 1 Kings 18, uh, he prayed that it wouldn't, wouldn't rain. And for three and a half years, there was no rain. Everything stopped. It was a time of testing and a, and a validation of, of Elijah's ministry. So it, when these trumpets sound here in chapter 8, if you read the whole chapter, you'll see they're pronouncing things. 
they're pronouncing trouble that's coming. Things that will be testing and refining humanity. Um, and the first will be disasters on the earth. Then that's in verse 7, verse 8 and 9. Maritime disasters, disasters in the seas. Um, and there'll be in inland water disasters in, in verse 10 and 11. Disasters in the sky, verse 12 to 13. Demonic torment. Tremendous release of, of deception and, and uh, demonic activity in uh, chapter 9, going on from verse 1 onwards to 11. And then death and destruction will become so common, and these, these trumpets are announcing this all the time. Um, and then chapter, uh, chapter 11 goes on to explain about the bowls. So we have seals, trumpets, and bowls. All of these are, are, are ways God's coming at His people to show them that there will be times of testing. Jesus said that. Eh? Um, in this world you will have trouble, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. So when you have trouble, don't think that God has forsaken us. God is busy working through in humanity, working through uh, the consequences of our destructive decisions from the fall. I do believe that what happened in Genesis chapter 3, when the fall took place, uh, and the consequences thereof were not imposed by God, they were described by God. Because in Galatians 6 it said, God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that will he reap. Mm. And most of the stuff we're experiencing in our world today of its brokenness and of its pain is a result not necessarily of our personal sin, but of sin in the mismanaged universe. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Because of our mismanagement, we have all kinds of ecological problems, uh, medical problems, uh, philosophical problems. It's just it's, it's crazies going on around us as a consequence of the decisions we have made in our mismanagement of the mandate God gave us to rule and manage the earth under subjection to Him. We stepped aside from that. We ate the forbidden fruit and as a result now God is not mocked. Whatever we sow, we will reap. So we have the two witnesses. And then chapters 12 through 14 opens up what's called a, a melodrama. Um, and there's three parts to it. Um, there's the pregnant woman. Um, and if you've got your Bible still open, you go to uh, Revelation chapter 12. There's the, the pregnant woman. And, and some, some believe that that's a picture of, of, of Mary. Um, and for various reasons, I want to say I don't believe that. Uh, that that's a confusing image and John was by no means embracing and encouraging Maryology so it's not Mary um, and some believe it, it's, it's a picture of Israel um, the, but the best interpretation of this is that this, this pregnant woman is the church the church that, uh, uh, that has the, the dragon devil himself opposing it but even in the opposition of it she gives birth to a son so the church carries the nature of the Son. And so Revelation 12 is all about um, the church taking on the challenge, even though the dragon's coming at us to pursue the purpose of God until the Son becomes evident. And we bring forth the Son, this new humanity. It's good, man. And um, you see in Genesis 3, verse, verse 15, <coughs> um, this is what uh, God says as a consequence of the fall. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers and he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. This is God's pronouncement over the serpent, over the dragon as Revelation calls it. Uh, the dragon that comes to deceive and to capture, like not just state capture, we're talking about capturing humanity, keeping it locked up and uh, uh, God said to the serpent in Genesis 3.15, um, I will put enmity between you and the woman and her seed will crush you. It's interesting because if you read Romans chapter 16 verse 20, right at the end of Romans 16 verse 20, he says uh, that uh, God will soon crush Satan under your feet. He actually uses that exact same expression that we pick up in Genesis 3.15. So the church has been called to bring forth the Son. Let Him become known. 
and, and uh, withstand the dragon um, that is opposing us. Uh, of course, in, in, if you go on in Revelation chapter 13, uh, we now have the picture of the dragon coming as a satanic triangle, satanic trinity, if you like, um, uh, where the, there's a, the dragon is a counterfeit for Father God. Uh, the first beast that is mentioned in Revelation th uh, 13 is, is, a, is a counterfeit for Jesus. Uh, it's a political Jesus. And you remember Judas wanted to force Jesus' hand to become a political liberator. And he refused to do that. And uh, Judas, thinking politically, thought he could bring up a scam of 30 pieces of silver and work the thing out. And it didn't. It backfired on him. Yeah. The answer for our nation is not going to be uh, a political one. Yeah. Josh and I were invited to a meeting on Friday. Thursday. 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 Thursday, Thursday lunchtime. We had a meeting with Musi Maimani down at Steers. And we're talking some things through with him about uh, uh, the future of South Africa and, and how, where the answer really lies. And I'm absolutely convinced what we need in this nation is a movement like the kingdom of God. We need the kingdom of God yes, to sir. roll and people to awaken because we have a, a huge number of people that, de that declare and profess mm. faith in God. Mm. Right. If we were true about that, if we embraced the kingdom, we would shake off all our petty differences and oh. rise up and bring a complete renewal to our nation. Mm. So this uh, counterfeit Jesus, the, the first beast that is in Revelation chapter 13, is a political Jesus, which is not the, the real deal. And then there's a second beast, um, which is, he describes in religious terms, and that's a, a counterfeit of the Holy Spirit. It will be counterfeit religion. Uh, we, were, we were talking, we were doing a trip together, Josh and I, the last two days as well, and, just, um, uh, and we also met some people that we spoke to on the way that... Uh, uh, remind me of how easily and how commonly religious leaders can resort to scams sure. and deception mm. to bring about an effect. I don't want to advertise the evil works of darkness, but I'm just simply saying, let's be discerning. Mm. Let's stand with what is true. And let's not fall for the schemes and scams of, of mankind. And let's, let's stay true to the true gospel. The gospel that changes lives from the inside out. The gospel that can't be bought and sold for 30 pieces of silver. Yeah. Uh, and, and in chapter 13, he also talks about the mark of the beast um, that must be put on, on your forehead and, and on your hand in order for you to, to be able to continue in that system. Let's just be clear about something here. We understand the need for Christians to submit to the government. Romans 13 says we should do that. We should pray for the government. We should submit to the government. We should be uh, um, compliant with uh, good governance. But however, when you come to Revelation 13, what was beauty becomes the beast. Mm. And you need to oppose him in Revelation 13. Sure. It's not right to continue saying, well, uh, God will just judge him. I must just submit to him. And if, it, if he's calling you to unethical behavior, you need to reject him. Yes, sir. Such as we have, be, we've moved into that sphere now in South Africa. Mm. We have moved into a sphere where ineptitude and corruption has taken over. I've heard the ANC now being called African National Corruption. <clears throat> we are living in times when we are needing to put our lives on the line. Just like the there were those that had to oppose the evil government systems of apartheid and stand for truth in civil disobedience. And so there's a groundswell of thinking through how do we oppose the evil regulations that have been put on us um, at this time and stand true. Are we moving now from Romans 13, are we now in a Revelation 13 context where you've got rulers like Nero and Domitian, emperors that were blatantly evil, and sensual, and um, there's no way you needed to walk in complicity with them. You need to oppose them, and that's what he's talking about here. And then, uh, going on in chapter 14 of Re Revelation, he speaks about the 144,000 and of judgment. So I want to just make one comment about that. There've been lots of speculations about what that 144,000 represents. Is it Jehovah's Witnesses, <laughs> members of the uh, of, of that movement? Uh, or are these Jewish Christians? What is that in 44,000? Well, remember, as we said last week, 
Uh, numbers mean uh, symbolically some significant things in the book of Revelation. If three is the number for, for God uh, in his Trinitarian expression, four is the number for the earth, north, south, east, west, the four corners and directions of the earth. So three times four makes 12, and that's the government of God. 12 is a, is a, is a number for, for leadership. It's, a, it's God leading on the earth. And we've got uh, 12 times 12. You get 100 and, huh? 144, if my math's right, or is it Zuma? Is it like Zuma? <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, so you've got 144. Then you've got the thousands comes from 10 times 10 times 10. 10 is a number of, of, a, of a plan that is complete, and it's threefold. It's God's completed plan. And so it's, it, 144,000 represents all of God's people fulfilling his purpose and his plan upon the earth. Does that make sense to you? No. It's you and me. He's got our number. We're in it. <coughs> As opposed to the, the number of the beast, which is 666. Remember, because man was made on day 6. And 6 is an incomplete number. The creation wasn't completed yet. And, and man uh, is given that number. And 666 is 366. It's man seeking humanistically to replace God. Mm. When they want to take the Bible out of our schools, take prayer out of, our, out of our society, and they want to make a life that is completely just humanistic. The number of the beast is, to, to, is, is, is the insistence to live life absent from God. Sure. And by the way, that number is put on the forehead on the hand. In other words, it influences the way you think and what you do. So we need to have... Um, our minds renew that we don't find ourselves obeying what should be disobeyed. There is a time for civil disobedience. <clears throat> and that's why Revelation is, uh, it was a tumultuous time. And it's been like that over the 2,000 years. There have been s significant seasons of, of hardship and persecution and loss, as we spoke last week with those what's called the four horses of the apocalypse. Remember the, the, the white horse and then the three others. The white one was the, the message of Jesus himself coming through, the white horse. And, and then the other three were the opposition and the persecutions. And, and, and John used that imagery then. In 9, chapter 15 and 16, he uses the imagery of bowls, uh, servings, if you like, poured out. Servings poured out of, of adversity, of of pain, of difficulty. And he's saying, this is what's happening. These things are taking place. Um, and um, you, you know, there was a thing in, in history called the Pax Romana, Roman peace. The peace that Rome brought to all the scattered, hostile Germanic tribes in uh, Eastern Europe and all over the place. Rome brought an order to it called the Pax Romana. However, beyond the order they brought, they also brought as they allowed, because that's what happens when uh, too much power and too much uh, prosperity comes on a, on a ruling party, they begin to become arrogant and begin to become uh, evil for their followers. And, and that's what happened. Rome began to decline because it imploded on itself. Um, and John is, 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 is talking about this here. Um, and there's a need for us to, to challenge whether we have find ourselves now moving into that kind of life where we are no longer actually advancing the shalom of God, but actually advancing a purpose of man that is a corrupt purpose. And we have to be whistleblowers and say no more. So in chapter 16, uh, he lands on the discussion from verse 13 onwards of Armageddon. <clears throat> and this essentially is an invisible battle. It's not fought with tanks and planes necessarily. Sometimes tanks and planes may be an expression of, but the true Armageddon is a spiritual battle. It's a battle for the soul of mankind. It's a battle against the church in particular. In chapter 20, which we'll look at later, uh, he, he describes this battle from verse 7 onwards as a, um, a battle uh, opposing the church, taking the church down. But it does land in the final defeat of Satan. He has a, a final defeat. And, and along the way, uh, towards that, uh, that moment uh, where Satan is defeated, we are being called out 
to, to be um, defiant of evil instruction and to stand with what is, what is right. So, um, scriptures speak of, of the Christian life being a fight of faith, that which we've got to rise, we be raised up to, to, to implement um, and to, to oppose Satan. In, if you just flip back to chapter 12, you remember uh, verse 10 and 11, uh, he says, Then I heard, again he's listening, hey, I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. It's the now. It's happened, huh? For the accuser of our brothers, who accuses them before our God day and night, has been hurled down. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. That is the justification by faith, a gift that is given us because of what Jesus did for us. We used to sing that song, there's power, there's power, power in the blood, huh? Power in the blood of Christ. I'm going to stay right under the blood where the devil can do me no harm. That's coming from this scripture here. We overcome the evil one by claiming a righteousness that is not our own, that is given us by God in Christ. So we are dead, but Jesus is alive, and I'm alive in Him. So then he says, and by the word of their testimony, they, we speak, we are witnesses. We speak of the ongoing grace of God that's been poured into our lives as we overcome obstacle after obstacle, and uh, persecution after persecution. And then in verse 11, the last part, and they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Um, <clears throat> that's because we have committed to a purpose other than our own survival. Where we don't even, we, we, we would put our survival second to his greater purposes. Survival can never trump revival. So I shouldn't use the word trump. <laughs> you, you've got to understand revival is much more significant than survival because we've, we've, uh, we've passed on. From, uh, from the fear of death. It's lost its sting for us. Eh? And if we take all of this and we start thinking, what are, the, what are the things we're doing battle with? What does our Armageddon look like? What our corruption and our ineptitude uh, that facilitates corruption um, are huge in this country. Even this last week, I, I, I was very disturbed to read of the resurgence of, of Ukukwala, the practice of uh, young girls being snatched away, literally kidnapped, and, and uh, sold into marriage with men that are 50 years older. It's become illegal in our nation, but it hasn't stopped. Culturally, it still operates. Why? Because much of the culture is still ruled by the spirit world of the ancestors. God wants to challenge us about all that. And if we can let our light shine, we've got to expose that darkness. Just like... Um, Female genital mutilation has been another darkness, a practice that has, pra that, that has prevailed, especially in Central Africa and up towards the north. Uh, especially, not only, but especially. And this, uh, what this, what's called FGM, needs to be opposed. Um, and our light needs to shine. And this is where the battle is for us. And, and many of our practices that we've, we've engaged in, uh, that we say, well, is it my culture? Well, maybe your culture has been corrupted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe the ball was supposed to serve a good purpose once upon a time, but it's become an evil practice of, of, of human trafficking. Yeah. It doesn't achieve what it used to achieve, what it's, maybe it was intended to achieve in its purest origins. It's become an evil practice. I mean, there's one girl that was taken under Ukutwala with her mother's blessing and sold, listen to this, just now in the last two weeks, sold for three cows. Come on, man. What kind of mother is that? And the mother still doesn't think she did anything wrong. How, how dark, how, how confused, how deceived can you be? This is our Armageddon. We've got to oppose these things. Yes. And, and what's, what's the wisdom in, in practicing a, a form of Maqueta where 40, uh, just in our own direct metropole area, 40 young men die on average every year from the practice of Makweta. Yeah. Come on! And as if to say that if you've had your foreskin cut off, you'll be a mature, trustworthy man. You need a lot more cut off to be there. <laughs> <laughs> Come on! <laughs> and, and the saying that we have, what we're hearing, and this is, these are expressions of, of Armageddon. 
We have to oppose these enemies that are coming uh, and, and, and restricting this, this new humanity. But the saying that we hear again and again in these days, about it's our turn to feed now. That tells me that that which was the victim now wants to be the oppressor. And we can have this uh, dingbat going on and on. Where, where there's a vying for the oppressor, for the position of the oppressor. Uh, and it's, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a falsehood. Uh, I've also been troubled by, uh, and let's speak of ourselves as churches and uh, movements, I've been troubled by the uh, uh, expressions of controlling leadership and what I call a pseudo-discipleship, where people or members are told how to dress, what to do, uh, how to think ethically, instead of equipped to think it through and to embrace and listen to God. Because true prayer listens. Mm. And uh, some churches have a controlling system over others. And, uh, um, and so their membership becomes dependent on your level of sanctification. Mm. And yet, think about it, it's justification that gives us peace with God. Yeah. Oh. Therefore, being justified by faith, Romans 5 verse 1, we have peace with God. It's justification Amen. in which we, we then, in the context of that given gift of righteousness, we, we begin to explore this love relationship with Him. And the love changes us. That's right. The love sure. transforms us. Not law. Yeah. Not, not even the law of God, nor the law of, of, of domineering leadership. We, we want to have churches and, and movements that are, uh, that are not mammon addicted, not doing things for money's sake either. Mm. Nor title attached. This use of titles, it's crazy. Mm. It's a deception. It's, well, I, would, I would classify it along with the, the satanic trinity as part of that second beast of a counterfeit Holy Spirit. Yeah. When you have a recourse to a, a title, this is not, this is not godly. It would help us. I know we're knocking some things here, but we've got to get some things straight and clear that uh, would otherwise keep us confused and compromised. And, and God wants to clean things up for His church. So, if we land on Roman, in Revelation chapter 16, I want to land with, with just four very comforting truths uh, that come out of this chapter. And the first is, if you read verse 15 of Revelation chapter 16, um, Behold, I come like a thief, He says, eh? Blessed is he who stays awake and keeps his clothes and with him so that he may not go naked and be shamefully exposed. Sure. Behold, I come. So here's the first comforting truth. Jesus is coming back. He's coming back. In the same way that we saw him go, he says, I will be back. You'll see me come again. I'll come again. He's coming. The second thing I want you to see in verse 17. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air and out of the temple came a loud voice from the throne saying, it is done. Doesn't that sound like Jesus in Revelation, John chapter 19, verse 25, where he says, It is finished. Yes, Clar and Chadan. Yeah. Huh? Finished and Clar, as we say. Mm. <laughs> he, he has established that we, we are living beyond D Day now. We, we, we really have the, the victory guaranteed us uh, because of what Jesus did at the cross, and now we are on, on the mop up mm. towards the final victory. V, v day or VE day. So we have, we have uh, the second comforting truth is uh, that um, Jesus has taken our judgment. Yeah. We will never be judged by God. If you're a believer, you won't be judged. Have no fear of judgment. Therefore, no fear of death. I mean, none of us wants to willingly, masochistically ask to have more pain in the way we die. But death itself is no longer our enemy. Yeah. And however we're going to die, God will give us grace for that. Yeah. Jesus took our judgment. Eh? Uh, it is done, he said. It is finished. Uh, and we don't have to live with a fear hanging over us. And the third comforting truth, if we land on in, in Revelation 16, going back it up to verse 9, he says in verse 9, um, they were seared by the intense heat and they cursed the name of God who had control over these plagues, but they refused to repent and, and glorify God. There was a delay. There was a delay. Judgment is often delayed. Um, but don't take delay as denial of it. God, God doesn't pay at the end of every day, but at the end He pays. It's not on us, but on the oppressors and the evil. 
And I know we, I've had discussions with some over the last number of weeks who say, surely, surely if God is, is loving, then surely um, everybody in the end must get saved. Well, here's the thing. God wants all men to be saved. But they won't necessarily unless they choose it. Choice is essential to love. So he's giving us an opportunity. 2 Peter 3 verse 9, he said, God wants everyone to repent and to come to salvation. So the delay is giving us an opportunity to be the witnesses of God in this fallen world. And then back it up to verse 7 of, of chapter 16. I heard, he said again, I heard the altar respond, Yes, Lord, Lord God Almighty, true and just are your judgments. So last thing I want to say there that the judgment of God upon the earth will be completely, totally just. Um, it's, he's not, doesn't become evil in the last days. God is true to who He is, and He will lead us in a way that will be liberating for us, establishing for us. Um, we're going to go on from this uh, next time I can have a moment to do that. And, and we will look into other aspects of this uh, book of Revelation and how He leads us to pray. But Hold on to this. What he's saying to us today is that prayer listens. Prayer hears. Prayer opens up for the intuitions of God and the voice of God and the leading of God, the heart of God. He shows things to us as we, as we pray. Um, and then I'm going to ask uh, Declan to come up here. Where are you, Dick? Come up here and let's get your guitar out there again. I want to uh, ask you to lead us in a song that I've been so stirred up. I've heard it over and over again over the last week. Uh, it's, it's sometimes called the Battle, Battle Hymn of the Republic uh, from its use in the 1860s of the Civil War in America between North and South, particularly in the abolition of, uh, of the slave trade to set slaves free and the abolishment of, of slavery. And that was in large measure what that war was about. There were other motivations for it as well, but in large measure that's what it was about. And um, they, they wrote this hymn at that time. Um, and it's just such a stirring, lovely thing. And I, I thought it would be good for us to, 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 to listen and, and maybe to sing it along with Jack. And I think you've got, I don't know, you've got the words? They've got the words. It's great. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Do you remember that song? Huh? There's a militancy about our faith. And I want to encourage you, listen to God. Because when He speaks, that's the safest place to be. Following through on the things that He's saying. Won't you, as we go forward this week, whether you are in this group that's here today or back home, won't you take time to listen? Listen to the Lord and share what He, share, what he gives you. Uh, open it up. Become part of the witness campaign that He's called us to home. Let's stand together. Uh, I know we've got our masks on. It's difficult to sing, but just put your heart out there. If you want to sing without your mask, just stand away from somebody else in there. Let's enjoy. Lord, we thank you for the victory we, we celebrate in this moment. Yes, that Lord. you speak to us. Hallelujah. And you call us to listen. Mm -hmm. and, and because when you speak, healing and hope, transformation, empowerment, and your presence, all these things begin to open up for us. So Lord, as we sing this song, and it's really a, a prayer song unto you, would you continue to speak to us and transform us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Oh, uh -huh.
wait, you mean again? Can we do it again? Can we like do it again? No, no. Why not, eh? Why not, man? Come on. You're just warming up. Just, just, just catch all the verses so they can. Have you got the other verses there? Looking here. She's missing one. Looks like one. Okay. So, you sounded for the trumpet. We, we saw, I think we got that one. Eh? It shall never call retreat. He's sifting out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. Be swift, my soul, to answer him. Be jubilant, my feet. Our God is marching on. I think we got that one. How about this? He's coming like the glory of the morning on the way. He's wisdom to the mighty. Mm. He is succor to the brave. Mm. So the world shall be his footstool and the soul of time his slave. Isn't that amazing? Eh? Yeah. Sure. Powerful words. And, and I love the thing. As he died to make men holy, let us, let us live to make men free. Eh? Wow. Amen. Sure. Let's just sing it again. Come on. Yeah. Come on. And I see the glory of the coming of the Lord He's traveling up the mountains where the grapes are on the floor He's loose the rainbow like an ox, terrible as a sword His truth is marching on Glory, glory, hallelujah Glory, glory, hallelujah Glory, glory, hallelujah that is ours in Jesus. Lord, I pray for every one of us that we would find ourselves empowered by your Spirit yeah. to listen better and to walk by what we hear. Thank you, Lord. That we would be your witnesses with a new boldness upon us as your Spirit speaks to us and then through us. I pray for those who do battle with fear at this time. Lord, I pray that fear would disappear in the overwhelming awareness of your perfect love. Right now, for everyone present in this place and at home, wherever they might be, Lord, I pray for the banishment of fear yeah, and the revelation Lord. of your love. Jesus. That your love come, yes. shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit is given unto mm. us. Mm. That we would be a people who rise up and carry light amidst a dark and wounded generation. We pray for these things, Lord. Help us in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. And all the Lord's people said, Amen. Amen. Go have some coffee, guys. And if you're at home, you want to come pop over to the car park and come and get some. If you need any help, call us. We'd love to, to contact you and you know our details. Eh? So God bless you guys. Thanks for listening in today. Amen.